Hey guys, I just wanted to add to my video that I made about styrofoam mixes where I show you how I bagged it, pre-bagged it for an application that was a little larger. Some of you may not need to pre-bag, you can mix as you go and that's fine, but when you start using a lot of it, you don't want to be faced with having to pre-mix it. So that's why I'm making this video again. Uh, I had so many people call me with questions uh, regarding the formula they call, you know, and it's, I always reply, it's not a formula. It's formulations uh, because there's a varying degree of, of application diversity and strength requirements and costs and all kinds workability. Uh, the list is endless as to why we would vary the mix. But I, I think right now I'd like to expound on several points. One is the, the formulations, when, why, and how, and then the application diversity. My objective in shooting this video or adding to my content on this video uh, is that I want to give you, the, the viewers, the information you need because I've had so many people contact me via email, phone, and then just comments on the, on the video um, about this and that and the other. And I, I thought in one fell swoop, I was just going to try and cover all my bases. So there's a lot of talking here. And, and, but those that are interested will stick through it because there's, there's a lot to discuss on why we are even using this mix. What are these mixes that we're talking about? See, everyone's the styrofoam. I see so much of that on the internet and or the YouTube, and uh, I'm like, okay, styrofoam. Everyone's hell bent on it, and they see, oh, I'm going to use it for this, I'm going to use it for that, and I go, well, if you were my partner, I'd be kind of petition us to move away from that objective. But uh, the the bottom line with these types of mixes is they're lightweight. It's it's totally radically different from normal concretes and mortars that are not sought to be lightweight but sought to be strong. First of all, there's three elements to a formulation in my opinion. One is the paste. You know, what is the binding agent going to be? There's so many choices therein. Uh, the aggregates. Um, and I say that plural because I can mix different types of aggregates. Again, when you still look when you start looking at the dynamics of performance characteristics coupled with economic analysis and then workability and then the final the durability you know the the the, the application that you're thinking of using this for already has comprised in it a certain standard that has to be achieved for it to be quote unquote successful and with that said if we start out with the the paste then there's aggregate and then there's admixtures those are the three basic elements that go into a formulation and with regards to the paste, the paste that most people use across this world generally is a Portland cement. And again, Portland cement, like you find at the Lowe's or the Home Depot, masonry stores, stuff like that, typically one type one and two. It's it's one type of Portland cement, and that's what majority of us use. I wanted to discern my categorization of Portland cement. It's Portland cement, but what we're looking for is S-type cement, Portland cement. You'll find at Lowe's and Home Depot, regular Portland, it's 96 pounds. S-type Portland is 78 pounds. The reason it's lighter is because it contains S-type lime in it, as opposed to just straight Portland. Lime is less weight than is Portland. That's why it's 78 pounds. So that's a key in. The other thing, the orange is usually the Portland, and the blue writing is the S-type. You want to have a lime-based Portland because you, it's stickier. It helps to bind. Now, comprehensive or compressive strength, it goes down a little bit by the use of the lime. Lime is not, you know, you don't make cement out of lime because it would be really weak. But when it comes to the attribute of stickiness, it's and it binds together better. It stays together better. Uh, it's it's got to be used now. Some of you will not be able to locate S-type Portland cement, the 78-pound bag, and you're only forced to buy the Portland cement, uh, which is 96 pounds. What you can do is you can go buy a bag of lime, S-type lime, and now we've got to precondition our Portland to where before we start mixing it, we usually take some sort of a container and we take three parts of the Portland to one part of the S-type lime, and that now is S-type Portland cement, and that's my formula. Now you can vary up and down on that ratio, and the more lime you have, the weaker it is, but consequently the stickier it is. Uh, but I just wanted to throw that little caveat into your equation there. 
Uh, there's five types of Portland cement, though, with different characteristics and, again, different economic burden. Um, so there's other types of cements that are non-Portland, like mag cement, uh, magnesium oxide cement, or CSA, calcil sulfo aluminate um, cement, just to name a few. However, for the purpose of this video, um, I'm just going to stay with the Portland cement. One, it's readily available, and most of you won't seek anything but that um, on the economic front and just the readiness, the availability of it. So sticking with that as far as the video. Um, obviously, there are other uh, types of uh, binding agents that can be used that are not like for water applications. Uh, Plaster of Paris, for instance. Uh, drywall compound, which is a powder then mixed with water, uh, those can bind. I mean, I've made uh, sanded mixes on, on plaster in, or drywall texture that I've sand washed. It looks like cement when you're done. It's got a binderary aspect where it binds the cement, it dries, it stays on the wall. I mean, it's not real abrasive resistant, it's not impact resistant, but yet it's a, it's a binding agent. So there's a lot of binding agents. What are we talking about? wanting to build here and what are the the confines in which we find what's the variable count and then we start to say well this will work this won't and we start minusing off the things that we can't use and honing on the things that we really want to use obviously there's many different routes in meeting an objective for performance characteristics um, the vast majority of you haven't really been taught the formulization. See, we've done a lot of laboratory testing, ASTM laboratory testing that gives us, you make up a mix and you say, well, what's the compressive strength of this? And if you deal with an engineer and you're building something, they're going to want these datas to be able to compute uh, the values of what loads can be put on them, what shear strength, what flexible, I mean, all these things can be uh, sought by data through testing. And, and if you make a mix and you test it, then you really start to understand what performance characteristics you had. And you can tweak it from, from the aspect of the, what type of paste what type of the aggregate, what size of the aggregate, what's the aggregate to paste ratio, what's your water ratio to the uh, below items. Uh, there's a lot of ways of critique or tweaking a mix for better performance characteristics. Workability, sustainability or durability th through uh, you know impact and, and abrasion resistance. So the other thing about the aggregate to paste ratios is the simple thought of particle packing. I'll give you an example. If you have a four foot by four foot by four foot plexiglass uh, box, and I say to you, take six inch rock and fill that box. And uh, is that box full? Well, most people say yes. And I say, no, there's a lot of voids in between these six inch. So let's take now some three inch and some inch and a half and we'll combine that together and now we'll fill the box as a full now. Yeah, no, it's not. Um, we need to go three eighths, quarter, eighth. You start to particle pack. You reduce the amount of pl the placement of thick paste. You want a block wall that's got a nice, again, using that as a microscopic view into our mixes, you want paste, aggregate, paste, aggregate. You don't want a thick area of paste. And if you've got a big void between some aggregate, that's a weakness. So not only what type, and again, a blending of, of, uh, of types of aggregate, as well as their size are all beneficial to your, for, for increasing your performance characteristics. That said, now, as far as taking raw, dry, powdered Portland cement and turning it into a paste, which is our binder agent, um, most of us will use water. But what liquids could we use? Again, when we start to pursue this further in this video, I'm going to leave this, we're just going to use water for the moment. But when we get to the additive sections, you want performance uh, characteristics to be enhanced, we can do that. You want it to dry quicker, you want it to be flexible. I mean, all these things can be had with different additives. You can, you can really strike a, a, a mix into a lot more strength by these additives. So for the moment, we're just gonna talk about Portland cement being our paste and using water to make the paste, the Portland dry cement into paste. Now here again, uh, water to Portland cement, there's a ratio there. And 
what most people do, I see this a lot, just in the mixing of, of, of a material, people want to go with more liquid, it's easier to mix. It's easier to get the slurry, the combination of the elements into a harmonized state by having more liquid. But the more liquid we have, we get this little concoction that's made up here. And if we've got too much liquid, the liquid, keep in mind, it leaves the equation, hydrates out of the equation, leaving just the cement. And when you have a lot of liquid, think about little, little styrofoam beads of water that leave and they leave behind a little void space in the cement. Think of Swiss cheese on a microscopic level where you've got a bunch of holes. Well, you can take Swiss cheese and rip it. Well, you know, I'm not, not looking for tear strength on the cement, but it does uh, achieve a weakening aspect to have too much liquid into the paste. We want enough paste so that we can mix the aggregate in it. It binds together and it's workable. Beyond that, you start to get into a, a problem where you're, you're, you're creating a weaker mix. In the styrofoam, as you're mixing, if you're using a lightweight aggregate like styrofoam perlite or vermiculite, um, you start mixing that and the water, too much of it, makes the, the separation of the paste to the uh, foam or aggregates, lightweight aggregates, and they float. You've got to use just a minimal amount of water just to get that to stay together. And so that's kind of the water Portland cement ratio is a big factor. Then we have the paste to the aggregate ratio. And I'll get into that more in depth here. But again, if you're looking at um, uh, strength, um, you start to, you're in a lightweight objective. That's, that's your primary objective. I want lightweight. Well, okay. Um, the lighter weight mixes have less Portland. They have more of the styrofoam or the lightweight aggregate um, that that give you a, a, a weight reduction. The more foam to paste you have, the lighter the mix, but also the weaker the mix. The, the less foam to paste you have, the higher the strength and the higher the weight. So again, what are you trying to achieve here? Uh, I've made uh, for cavity, filling cavities behind my rock and then a substrate, I've made up to 10 to one, 10 foam to one part of the Portland cement. And it was enough Portland cement to bind it. I could shovel it into the void. I could tamp it down and it dried as a block, as a, as a monolithic form. And it, uh, it achieved the objective I was. But if I was trying to build a panel out of 10 to one and I go to pick it up after it's dry, it'd break. So what's the ratio of Portland or paste to the aggregate? I, I kind of skipped over, I've got some notes that I, I kind of gave me to kind of give me a guide here. And I wanted to speak to you all about the choices of aggregate because that in itself is a big su subject. Everyone's contacting me, all oh, the styrofoam, all oh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, oh, okay, well, you know, God bless you. Um, styrene is any more to find what we call regrind. See, people in the industry, co companies will take styrofoam and cut it, for instance, into various profiles and use it under various applications. They all produced a waste and that waste was undesirable for them. They had to pay to have it taken away. So a lot of companies started grinding it and selling it. And there was a lot of uh, birth in the industry. There was a lot of uh, applications for this regrind. And regrind, depending on the grinder, the chopper the, of this styrofoam, um, can be real little powder. It could be big clusters of, you know, 10 little styrene balls all, all together, very chunky. And I'll get into the aggregate sizes in our mixture uh, here in a moment. But right now, just focusing on everyone wants styrofoam. Well, people today, the, the regrind that they used to have a problem with, and they were trying to sell it to make up some, uh, make a negative into a positive, um, they're, they're densifying it now and they're selling it to people who manufacture virgin styrene product. And so you don't find, I've had so many people, oh, Jim, I can't find it. Do you know? It's like, I, I tried for a job that I was doing to find some, couldn't find it in the local area. If I started to venture out away from that area, I could probably find it, but it was at a premium because they realized that people are paying more for the regrind now. And then you've got burden of shipping cost added to it. So that's not necessarily the choice. My thinking is the four most readily available, uh, most used is pumice. And there's a variety of density. Uh, pumice is just a volcanic glass, if you will. And naturally it's just crushed and screened and you can get it in different sizes. And there's density differences too. 
and some of it's lighter weight. That means it's got more air in it. Some of it's heavier. It's got less air. So pumice, like a cinder block, a CUM block, concrete uh, measured unit. Um, these are blocks. A lot of people look at a CMU block wall and go, oh my God, that's fortified. That's, that's, that's Fort Knox. No. Cinder blocks were made to reduce the weight and, and somewhat the cost um, but they were just basically block walls that were forms to pour the cells and your bond beams when you do put rebar and you use more concentrated placement of cement. But you're creating a block wall, a cinder block wall, is merely a form. It's garbage in comparison to a real cement block or brick. Um, so uh, pumice is one. Obviously, styrene has been sought after. Now, styrene also has a problem in the sense of if it's around any temperature heat uh, above 400, it melts. So it's no longer really there. Uh, so I don't like it burns a toxic uh, 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 vapor from it when it does. Uh, it's not so ideal. Now, the two others that are sought after is vermiculite and perlite, and those are both naturally mined or obtained, and, and they were they were generated by heat, and again, you can find the different sizes of them and different densities of them, and the aspect of their being fireproof is right out of the right out of the chute, very attractive to me, but they really replicate a styrofoam-like quality in the sense this little bead or these clusters of beads combined together are air primarily and that's where we get the rate reduction think of a block wall i always like to say to people well you and i we're going to pour your driveway with just portland cement no aggregate let's just mix it up we'll pour it six inches thick and oh we got some there yeah we got a real expensive pour first of all we got a real weak pour it isn't going to last long it's going to break apart a block wall has a block mortar a block mortar the mortar is representative of our paste. If you get paste too thick, you start to get a weakness. You don't have mortar joints on a block wall that's two inches tall. It is weak. It's minimized to what is actually needed to, to the objective. That is to bond this block to that block steadfast for a duration of time. Um, think of the block now as being the aggregate in the mix. If you look at a block wall in a microscopic kind of a thought, paste, aggregate, paste, aggregate. So I was saying about the, the, the thick mortar joint, you, you don't want a thick mortar joint. Now let's just build a wall, a cinder block wall with no mortar. We'll just stack the block one on top of another. And as long as somebody breathes by it or looks at it or touches it, it should stay foot. No, you can't build a block wall without the mortar. Just like you can't make a mix without the paste. You know, you gotta have that bindery agent. So um, when, we, when we start delving into the aggregates, as I said earlier, we depart from the standard normal aggregates and we start to go into the lightweight. Well, there's a lot of, of different types of aggregates. There's expanded clay, there's shale, there's slate, uh, diotomite. Um, trying to think of some others. Um, oh, the other the other thing that people are doing to make lightweight cement, which I, I really have a problem with, is is uh, cellulite and air entrainment, like aircrete. Let's mix up aircrete mud which is basically just an agent to make a bubble if you will in the cement again you've got nothing but a hole and that's just like a piece of styrofoam being in there a little styrofoam bead it ain't no structure but it's better than just air i'll give you an example uh we make a lot of cardboard structures like my easter island statue or big rocks that we've made and those really just have a form on the outside and we mud over that leaving an air space in the void and that's great, but it's not as good as if you carved a styrofoam, a bulk piece of styrofoam, you've got like a unibody. Now styrofoam, I'm telling you, that is the rock of Gibraltar. No, it didn't go that far, but it's better to have a plug of styrene, a whole plug and coat over it because I can pick that up and throw it and it won't break as easy as if I had the same item made out of cardboard with a void hole in it and you throw it. You could break that a lot easier than you can a plug type of thing. So I'd rather have an aggregate that was whole in the mix, not just air, but just a whole piece of aggregate that gets incorporated into the matrix of the system. It's stronger. So I'm not a big fan of aircrete. Again, aircrete uh, cellulite is in my toolbox. I don't throw it away because there might come a time where I have an abundance of that element and or the job 
prescribes that it's the best thing to use. So I keep it, but it's not my favorite. But I'm just saying uh, air entrainment or cellulite is, is, is not an aggregate. It's like an aggregate though. And what it does, it displaces cement. That's the big thing there. It makes more air and makes the cement more air-like. So anyway, um, with regards to aggregate, um, again, availability is a big factor to me. How soon can I get it? How cheap can I get it? You know, so those are the things that I'm always looking for. Sometimes that'll route me a different direction than my preferred. Um, so again, suppliers, not only do they vary as far as what they offer and when they can get it and how much they can get it for, but the quality of certain types of uh, uh, lightweight aggregates can vary supplier to supplier. So again, working the variable count that you have will yield you a certain result. And, and beyond that, you have to tweak it to get better. What are the applications? I wanted to go back to that. I get a lot of people say, oh, I'm gonna build a, a shed. I'm gonna make some styrofoam panels. And I'm like, okay, uh, tell me more. You know, And this is what they say, we're gonna make a form. We're gonna put it you know, this thick, say four inches, and we're gonna put the foam mix in there. I just need your recipe. They, a lot of people say recipe. Well, in our world, it's a formula. When you're cooking in the kitchen, you can use the word recipe, but we are looking at what is the formula as a routine thing. And again, if I was gonna make a four inch you know, element there, typically my mixtures, which I'm kind of departing from the section I'm in, but uh, three to one, three uh, parts of foam to one part of the Portland cement makes a pretty good mix. The stronger you go, the, the, as I said, the more weight and the more cost. But um, why are people, you know, thinking that you can take this panel, stand it up, and now you've got styrene exposed to the sun. First and foremost, that's going to yellow. Secondly, it's going to degrade, and it's going to leave little holes in your surface. If you're going to have an external exposure of the foam, you've got your thoughts all wrong. You're going to have to coat that with something. And what I would generally recommend is increasing a mortar base kind of cement in its strength and adding additives such as an acrylic fortifier uh, admixture to get that height uh, compressive strength up. And then again, well, what about reinforcements, fiber, mesh, uh, some sort of a steel. A lot of people say, oh, chicken wire. Chicken wire has been used in stucco applications, but it's it's not the best reinforcement in my opinion. But anyway, you can't make this application work for you. It doesn't make sense. And if you're looking to, to take a, a, a panel, I, I would suggest taking styrofoam sheets and coating it with a high strength cement on both sides. And now you've got something you're hunting and you still got a lightweight reduction. So um, that's kind of a thing. But the applications I see is lightweightness. That's, and that's a big umbrella that covers a lot of different applications. Uh, as I look at void filling, for instance, I have the styrofoam in my toolbox and primarily I use it for two reasons. One's to insulate spas, pools, ponds, anything that's gonna be heated ongoing because the, the, the cementaceous gunite will thermally suck water or temperature into the ground like nobody's business. Um, so insulating that with a six inch layer of styrofoam mix before you do your steel and your gunite just breaks that, that, that connection. Now keep in mind, uh, it would be better if you took styrofoam, if you could magically lay it into this you know, sheets of it, like they'll put it underneath foundations. That's a little easier than a, than a pool that's shaped irregularly. But uh, if you could just go with styrofoam sheets, you'd have a lot better insulation. Uh, when you start talking about mixing Portland cement into a styrofoam or vice versa, you've got veins of conductivity through the paste. And they're, they're channels that are going to suck a, a lot of you know, temperature away from your unit. Um, it isn't as bad as just gunite. It's a reduction of, of, of contact or, or, or uh, conductiveness uh, through the cementaceous mix, but it's certainly not like uh, spraying, sp spray down some high density foam, then build your pool on that. Now that now you're hunting, but again, your prices just went out of the roof. So again, lightweight applications. Uh, we used to do floors, uh, apartment complexes, and you got the second story, and you got a person above, a family above, and they're trampling around. You're hearing it downstairs. So we used to put, we used to put a plate 
uh, double plate on our for on our forms, and we would pour an inch and a half of this lightweight cement that yet was durable enough to 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 put flooring on. It would stay down, and you know it would deaden the sound of the above people to the below people. And that's again, there's a lot of lightweight applications that we can make. When I go to make a rock, that's something I got to move regularly. Um, I want it to be lightweight. Well, styrofoam muds have helped me in that regard. But as I, I look at styrofoam primarily, I'm kind of of a thought, let's use it for, you know, insulation, which is not high in insulation. A lot of people think, well, I'm going to build a house with it and it's going to save me utilities. And it's probably the least uh, insulative thing that you could draw to, to use. Uh, it's not as highly insulative as people make it out to be. Um, the it's lighter than regular mud though, but it's not insulative. So a lightweight in void filling and or building bulk, you know, I'll, I'll throw it on walls. If you mix up some styrofoam, let's take regular mortar, you throw it on the wall, a regular mortar makes you get about an inch and a half build out and then it wants to fall off the wall. Foam, uh, one big handful and I, I stick it on the wall. I can stick it out six to eight inches. I kid you not, I've done it. So in some applications, the lightweight bulk build out can be done very successfully and economically and quickly with time. And yet you can still carve it after it's dry if you like to manipulate it for further effect. Um, so a lightweight cement has its place. Uh, insulation, as I said earlier, the sound deadening uh, approach to things. Like for instance, I'll make a half inch panel of my rock and I'll never forget, I had one on the back of my truck running a waterfall, a big old rock. And I was sitting in a jack-in-the-box one day, and subsequent to that, I saw it very regularly. But people, when I wasn't there at the truck, were like a magnet and a nail. They were attracted to that that rock. And the first thing they do, they, they touch it. It's up high, up on the truck. And then they knock on it, and they hear a hollow. And right then, the gig's up. That's not a real rock. They know it. And it turned me off of the hollow rock technology. I still wanted the cost-saving measures that were found in it, but now I had to say, how could I deaden the sound? So we would take a half-inch rock and we would put about an inch and a half to three inches of a styrofoam mixture, cement mix, and knock on it now and it sounds solid. So, you know, again, there's, there's a place and a time for everything, um, and that's one of them. So void filling, sound deadening, lightweight, and insulative movements for it now now uh getting into the formulations which now we're gonna we're gonna after i start talking about the ratios we'll get into the additives that we could use um typically my styrene and i hate to use the word styrene because i don't find that people can get it as readily anymore so let's just use the word lightweight aggregate and my primary choices today are vermiculite and perlite just so you know they're more readily available and they're less expensive um, and they don't melt. They don't burn. They're already made by heat. That's how they were produced. As far as the aggregate formula to paste ratio, I have gone one part of the lightweight aggregate to one part of the Portland cement. Again, that's my heaviest, but it's my strongest mix. And it's my most expensive lightweight mix because you're using a one-to-one. I've gone from that all the way up to 10 parts of the lightweight aggregate to one part of the paste. Again, the lightest and the weakest and the least cost, okay? Because your Portland is a high-end co co consumption part of the, uh, the the mixture. Your your lightweight aggregate's the far less. But again, one to one to 10 to one. That's my, that's my I can't, really can't go any more than that. I wanna clarify again, the one to one, the 10 to one, yeah. And all in between, two to one, three to one, four to one, five to one, six to one, seven to one, eight to one, nine to one. Those are the basic parameters. One to one, all the way to 10 to one, and in between. And usually, you, I find myself at a three to one for most applications, just so you know. Typically, people, uh, think of it this way. Um, when you look at the formula, a three to one is my perfect mix in so many ways, economic, uh, uh, strength and then workability but stickability uh, a lot of times we're throwing this up against something on a wall or something and if it's any less if it's more aggregate than Portland cement like it's a four to one mix it doesn't stick 
you can put it in a void and it's got enough to bind it together. As I said, a 10 to one ratio has enough to bind it so I can fill a void and then tamp it in and it becomes one piece. It dries like a block, so it's great. It's got enough binder paste in it to make that happen, but it won't stick to a wall. Um, so again, that's kind of one thing. Uh, the second thing is, is the additives. Uh, again, going back to the paste being used with uh, just water. Uh, let's replace that water now with an acrylic admixture. Um, there are several different types of resins that we can add into a cement that are water-based. And um, <clears throat> again, when I say we're not using water anymore, most of our acrylics come concentrate and we have to dilute it with water. The acrylic or the latex or the latex acrylic is carried in water. The water evaporates, leaving behind the acrylic. And that's basically what we're talking about here. So adding those quickens the dry times, makes it more sticky, makes it stronger. Compressive strength kicks up and so does the flexual or tensile strength better uh, articulated. Um, water reducers in that same movement, plasticizers, these, these will add um, um, a liquefaction feel without having that extra liquid. Remember, remember, our liquid or our water ratio, the more we've got to reduce to the minimal amount to get it to be workable is the best. So water reducers and plasticizers will give us a more workable liquid-like mix without that liquid being there. So that's kind of a thing that we could do. Um, accelerators, uh, I remember back in the day, we would want our foam mixes to kick. And this is an old uh, chemical that we use was uh, uh, one that's kind of, sh you know, shunned in the industry today. It's one of my favorites is calcium chloride, but they found in long-term use, uh, it would eat cement reinforcement. So. It's still, if, you're, if you don't have any steel reinforcement, I mean, in your, in your um, foam mix, reinforcements, we just talked about being part of the formula in the process. Uh, it's a good thing, but in some cases, I didn't have to use it. You know, if I'm making a boulder and it's just a, a three by three boulder, you know, turtle shell, I like to call it, uh, I don't need that in there. When I go to put my hard coat over the top of it, I can fiberize or mesh those. The bulk shape, is really just air and void, even though it's substance, uh, it's it's not needing to be reinforced. But um, in the, in, like Master Builders is the additive king. For a hundred years plus, they've been supplying all kinds of cementaceous additives or cement additives for cementaceous mixes. Um, they have today uh, not calcium chloride, calcium chloride as far as, uh, 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 an accelerator, but they, they have mixes that aren't caustic to steel or people. Um, but yet, keep in mind, accelerators, you want to accelerate something, get your elements up to the highest temperature you can. Uh, ambient temperature, a lot of times, you know, in the winter time, if you had a, if you had a room that you could keep your Portland cement, your lightweight aggregate, your liquids, all in a room that was warm and you take them outside and you start mixing, you're, you're, you're at a higher ambient temperature of those things. That's going to make better than if you had all these elements outside. If you did a mix of the two, this one's going to set up faster because it had been heated. A lot of times we would heat our water. I mean, get it hot, really hot, and then mix it and we would find accelerations. Um, as a cement mix dries, there is a both a chemical and a... Uh, mechanical process that's going underway that generates heat. So if you trap it, uh, i.e. two ways, one convection, we use one mil plastic and that stops air flow taking away uh, the, the the temperature and then insulative means like a, like a, a sleeping bag, a couple of sleeping bags over something, you'll trap that heat and it starts to be a snowball rolling down the hill and it just makes it kick and, and get harder faster. So. Um, you know, taking a uh, accelerator and then again, the opposite. Uh, I'm, I'm an Arizona boy. It just happens to live in Oregon. And back in the day when we were in Arizona in the middle of July, our muds were kicking too fast. So we started to seek uh, uh, retarders. How could we retard this mix to give it more pot life, more workability? Um, so again, all those additives basically, you know, in a way of speaking, are cooling the mix. So we would ice down our water, ice down our uh, acrylics, 
keep our cement, sands, any aggregates that we're using, anything we're using to mix, keep it under a tarp instead of having it sit in the direct sun. A differential, not of a huge differential there in temperature, but the temperature decrease was an, a, a, a retarder. And so I'm not a big fan of buying either accelerants or retarders, but if you are inclined, those are additives. Um, so there's there's a lot, you know, uh, as we start looking at polysons, uh, you know, like metacalin, uh, fly ash, silica fume, um, bentonite clay, uh, there's all kinds of things that we can do to add strength to a formulation over just regular Portland cement. And again, the list is long when you start coming into formulation. Then we go to a process, which is coupling the formulation with a process has an X, Y, Z. One, two, three equals six. Two, two, three equals seven. Is there a lot numerically difference between the two? No, but there is a difference. Image-wise, there's a whole bunch of difference. But so, you know, keeping a formula and process, uh, developing those for the ultimate outcome is in your objective pool there. So um, now I'm going to depart from the formulas, the additive part of it, and um, get into now... You see in the video I've got that I add that I'm adding to. I played the same video where I was bagging 200 bags for a, for a job that I was doing to underlay it with a foam mixture to give it an insulated quality. There, um, if you're going to use a lot and you're outdoors, the wind with styrofoam or lightweight aggregates just blows all over the place. And to take the time when you're pouring something or you're applying a lot of mud and and you want not to be you know, slowed down by measuring and mixing. It's so nice to pre-bag. And that's what we've done on almost every job that we've done externally from the shop. If I'm in the shop and it's just a batch or two, I formulate or I, I measure as I mix and I'm good. But in this case here, the video following says I'm pre-bagging. And I wanted to show you how to do that in an efficient manner. It doesn't take a lot of equipment or a lot of time, but it does reduce when you start focusing on one element of the process and you get it done efficiently over being on site doing it and creating the mess out there and whatnot. So the pre-bagging or not bag pre-bagging is kind of an option for you to consider as well. But at the end of all of this, uh, two things come to my mind. One, I always appreciate the opportunity to serve. I find it a joy. It's what I love to do. I love to assist people doing things. I love to be in my trade and, and that passion that I love to engage. So if you have a question, if you've got an application that you're not sure of, don't ever hesitate, give me a call, email, text, whatever you find works. Those informations are in my uh, description area and I usually put my website and my uh, phone number on these videos as well. So give me a call. <coughs> um, second to that, I always wanna take the time to say, you know, I'm not a, a big content provider out there. I don't have a lot of subscribers, but I do have a loyal following and I'm growing. And I appreciate the opportunity you guys give me in taking the time, your precious time, to watch my videos, to make comments. And I, like I say, I hope to be of value to you and your pursuits, your objectives. So thanks a lot for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please take the time, give it a thumbs up, like, share, and subscribe. And uh, you all have a great and blessed day. Thank you.